morning. Um, welcome to this lecture series on um, chemically active ceramic oxides and their nanoheterostructures. Um, so this will be overview type lectures. Uh, so discussions and questions are encouraged. Uh, these are evolving topics, so sharing ideas would be wonderful. And if you want to discuss further, uh, see me after lectures um, and we can discuss uh, any of this topic in detail. Just to show where I come from, um, this is where Ohio, which is more than 550 miles west of New York, and it's too far from Los Angeles, more than 2,000 miles. And here's a map of Ohio. And you can clearly see um, Columbus is uh, almost centrally located in Ohio. So where is exactly uh, Ohio State University and uh, my office on that campus? Ohio State is a huge campus, one of the largest campus in the US. And um, I'm situated from this iconic structure, about five to seven minutes walk from that structure, which is the Ohio Stadium holding more than 100,000 people. So it's about five to seven minutes walk from that stadium in this building called Watt uh, Fontana Lab. And I'm on the fourth floor of this Fontana Lab. So if you, um, so my office would be somewhere around right there. So if you happen to be in the neighborhood of Columbus, please let me know. And I'll be glad to show you around the campus. Uh, before I get to my lecture topic, I wanted to show you success code for postgraduate um, studies and research. And I call that success code as RTDAD. And those RTDAD stands for, are for reading. So you have, you have to read a lot. And while you read, you need to think. Uh, it cannot be just passive reading. Uh, so think while you read. And then you need to discuss. And this is very important for postgraduate research is the discussion is the way that you get, you can sharpen your understanding of the topic. And also you can, by discussing with multidisciplinary uh, team of people, you can actually get ideas across. You can uh, propagate your idea and you can get new ideas from your colleagues from chemistry and physics and other engineering disciplines. So, and then uh, during discussion, you need to be active, not passive. So you need to ask questions like why and why not, and what if, um, and you can do reading and thinking and discussion and ask, asking, but finally you have to do the work. So you can see that this completes the uh, success code for postgraduate research. Um, so here's a schedule of my uh, uh, lectures. So today I'll start with chemical sensors and the environment and cover some of these aspects. And I'll move on to the resistive or semiconductive type sensor materials and cover the fundamentals, basic physics and chemistry. And then I'll move on to a specific resistive or semiconductive sensor and I'll take carbon monoxide sensor as a case study and show you actually how you fabricate one of the sensor and test it in the lab as well as in real environment. And I'll move on to electrochemical sensors, different kind that uses ionic conductors. And I'll go with the fundamentals first and then move on to specific electrochemical sensor and we'll take carbon dioxide sensor as a case study. Then I'll move on to elect AC electrical measurement and I'll apply it to electronic ceramics in particular for sensor research. 
And finally, the final topic would be will be on ceramic nanohydrostructures. And I'll spend quite a bit of time on, on this topic. So that's the plan. So with that, let me move on to the first lecture. This is the lecture on sensor materials and the environment. And I give you some references here that you can follow. And um, this is something from Delbert that was published in uh, Sunder Dispatch, Columbus Dispatch. And clearly Delbert is right that we can uh, make a computer that would be fully conscious, provided we have wonderful sensors to detect data. So if you have reliable sensors that can collect data, that can be fed into the computer to design conscious computer. So uh, that sort of highlights the importance of the sensor topic. And we actually, um, you know, if you take a systems approach, and not only you detect by using reliable sensors, but you, um, uh, through a feedback control system, uh, you can design a total system. So your total system requires both detection and actuating. And I'm not going to talk about actuators, but I will primarily talk about sensors. And you can see, um, you know, a human body is a wonderful source of very accurate sensing systems. And the competition in the chemical sensors is in the area of so-called electronic nose that we want to create an, a sensor array that would mimic the human nose. And there is also a lot of effort when it comes to chemical sensing in electronic tongue uh, to be able to distinguish between bitterness and sweetness and sourness and so on. So those are the active area of research in uh, chemical sensors. Um, Human body um, also is a wonderful source of a lot of very wonderful and accurate actuators. And again, when it comes to actuators, we are competing uh, with uh, what the human body entails in terms of natural actuating systems. So here is one way of looking at um, different categorizing sensor types. Sensor can be mechanical type, and you can see what is measured for mechanical sensing, similarly thermal sensing, electrical sensing, magnetic sensors, optical sensors, and chemical sensors, where you're looking at the composition, concentration of chemical species, etc. We are primarily going to talk about chemical sensors in my lectures. If you look at the, uh, you know, different types of sensors and based on, depending on what signal you use, so you can design mechanical sens sensor by using mechanical signal, or you can design mechanical sensor using thermal signal or electrical signal and so on. So you can see that we are going to talk about chemical sensors using electrical signals. So really we're talking about this box in this really huge area of sensing. And I'm primarily going to focus on this, this box here. So here, the slide uh, which I borrowed from the source shows the source of pollutant, primary pollutants that we get from Mother Nature as well as a lot of our uh, industrial activities and automotive um, exhaust, etc. And then uh, we can get secondary pollutants, which are created by reaction or interaction of the primary pollutants. So this is what we are trying to detect and protect the environment. And you can see the interest is that so we preserve our environment. Um, that we live in a healthy environment. 
So in terms of the market forecast for um, this kind of chemical sensors, uh, it's uh, projected to grow. In fact, in 2021, the market size was about $190 billion. And it's projected to grow to 1 trillion by 2025. And if you categorize sensor market in terms of applications, the industries, there's a list and I put asterisk star on various industrial application that requires environmental or combustion sensors that we mostly focus on. And again, you can uh, see that projection that I just talked about in terms of commercially available sensors, um, you can, you know, your electrochemical sensor that we'll talk about, catalytic type sensors, infrared sensors, fluorescence type sensor, and semiconductive oxide type sensors. So I'll primarily talk about the semiconductive oxide type and the electrochemical type in this lecture series. Um, and semiconducting oxides just cover about 40% of the materials that, that is used in chemical sensing. Uh, so here are the type of sensors that we work on. Well, again, combustion gas sensor, CO, oxygen, NOx, hydrocarbons, and CO2. You can see the targeted industrial application that we target. And for some of the applications, the temperature range can vary anywhere from room temperature to very high temperature, particularly in some of these industries. And this is why for some of this high temperature end application, we're looking for ceramic materials. Uh, in terms of concentration, we're trying to detect anywhere from low PPM parts per million to high percentage level. Sensitivity I'll talk about later, response time, depending on the application. So if you're trying to uh, detect in a dynamic environment like automotive exhaust, your sensor has to be very fast responding. But if you're trying to detect, um, let's say for carbon monoxide above a threshold limit in an office environment or in a lab environment, uh, the response time can be of the order of minutes or tens of minutes that we can still don't get um, hazardous effect by being exposed to, for example, 25 parts per million of carbon monoxide over um, several hours, actually. And obviously, interference is a big issue that can we detect selectively in a gas mixture. So how much interference you get from unintended gases, something that one needs to study. Poisoning can be a big issue because we want to re repeatedly use um, sensor, so reproducibility, stability, lifetime is another important area. So for automotive industry, for example, we're looking for sensor to survive hundreds of thousands of miles driven. And then there is power requirement and we power the sensor to heat it up by DC electricity or battery operated power source. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the primary application areas. And automotive industry is one of the primary areas. Um, you can see the Lambda sensor, which controls the air to field mixing ratio in auto combustion. Uh, that even the combustion happens at, at the stoichiometric level of air to field mixing ratio. We still pollute the environment by evolving, you know, pollutants such as carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, and um, NOx. So, uh, you know, so automotive industry, what they do is they use a catalytic converter to convert this further into non-polluting species. Um, and you can see what comes out of the emission tailpipe of an engine. 
uh, the type of species that comes out. And most of them are pollutant. And you can see that automotive market is expected to reach 20, more than 28 billion by 2030. The growth rate of about 4.5% uh, during this period. And back in 2020, it was predicted that automotive industry will utilize 22 billion sensors per year. And obviously this 22 billion sensors not only include chemical sensors, but all other types of sensors, mechanical and optical and magnetic sensor that goes in an engine um, automotive engine system. So this is a huge area of application and you can see how this um, cleaner car legislation is evolved in the United States. So the Clean Air Act um, was initiated in 1970. And the emission standard was set in 1975. And the Congress then implemented the, um, amended the Clean Air Act to uh, higher and higher standards, um, leading to tightening of the emission standards further, leading to tier one in 1990, that took effect in 1994, moving on to tier two in year 2000, where the standard uh, specification becomes even stricter. And um, tier two started implementation in 2004, and then Tier 3 standard was set in 2014, and Tier 3 standards started phasing in in 2017, and which is supposed to be completed by year 2025. And if you actually follow the uh, emission of NOx, in particular from Tier 1 to Tier 3, you can see that when the Emission standards were, uh, uh, you know, set in 1975. The NOx emission level was about three three grams per miles driven car. And then uh, in tier one, that was brought down to 0 0.6 grams per miles. And in going moving on to tier two, 0 0.07 grams per miles, and this is, it is supposed to further decrease uh, by the end of tier three in 2025. Uh, so a little bit about the catalytic converter in the car. It's actually made out of a ceramic material, go to your right. You can make it in the form of beads or monolith, and the uh, surface area of this whether it's a beads or monolith, is covered by the catalytic uh, agents such as platinum, palladium, and rhodium. So if you look at the bead type, so these are beads of cordierite material that is packed, and it's, um, it's a kind of a porous structure through which your exhaust gases will percolate through and come in contact with the catalyst and the purpose of the catalyst to, to promote the reaction, for example, breaking up NOx into nitrogen and oxygen and so on. Or the catalytic converter would be in the, could be in this monolithic form where you take a uh, kind of a, uh, you know, slurry material that can be shaped. So you, you can drill holes through that, you know, green body and then after you fire, you will see that square holes are created. So if you take a closer look at this, so these are the holes created by the extrusion process in that monolith, and the surface of these holes are covered with your catalyst, like platinum, palladium, and rhodium, and basically the gas is going to flow through the holes, uh, and 
these reactions are catalyzed by this reactant. So the catalytic converter further cleans the environment by decreasing the um, polluting species. So this shows actually the um, catalyst efficiency in the catalytic converter that um, but the engine operation that is done around the air to fail mixing ratio stoichiometric level, we can see the conversion of all of the species percent conversion is in, is in the 80%. So all of this conversion happens very efficiently by the catalytic converter around the stoichiometric air to fail mixing ratio. There are needs for um, gas sensors in glass and metal processing industries. Um, so you're trying to detect flue gases, uh, species like NOx, CO and oxygen, and you want to monitor the emission of these burner by burner in a glass melting furnace, for example, or a metal heat treating commercial scale furnaces. And the monitoring environment is in a hot zone the temperature range is anywhere from 500 to 1000 degrees Celsius of the burner. So you need high temperature ceramic sensors for this kind of application. And you can see some of the implication of, uh, in terms of the Department of Energy, who's interested because this is very energy intensive processes. Uh, the other application is the so-called um, you know, the natural gas burner, where, um, so this would be in-home application that um, a lot of the uh, winter dominating countries, uh, gas um, furnaces, gas burning furnaces are used, but there is a need for monitoring for um, health hazard and health safety reason, monitoring those flue gases, noxy and oxygen, and detect those and through a um, you know, system approach that um, it, it's sent back to, um, the data is sent to an actuator to make sure the mixing uh, is done in a way that these species are minimized because these are pollutants and exceeding certain level of this can be health hazard for a home setting. So many of the Japanese houses are actually uh, equipped with this, this kind of, kind of systems. Um, there are um, need for chemical sensors in petroleum industries, for example, both upstream where exploration and production is done, uh, safety monitoring, mostly hydrocarbon sensor, corrosion monitoring, they're looking for hydrogen sulfide and CO2, and environmental monitoring, they're looking for CO2 and NOx. Um, there is need for downstream um, processes where petroleum refining happens, and there you're looking for, again, flue gases, CO, NOx, SOx, hydrocarbon, and particulate. And for the particulate matter, there are a lot of uh, very nice and very accurate optical means that you can use to detect. Um, talk about the CO2 sensor, obviously need for CO2 sensor is huge for monitoring green greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide. And you can see some data about CO2 production worldwide. And the US actually contributes um, substantial amount of CO2 in the environment. And um, Obviously, this shows some data of how we are accumulating CO2 in the environment. By the way, H2O is also a greenhouse gas, but we don't talk about H2O because H2O can be recycled through rain and snow and so on. But CO2 is something that you um, generate CO2 and it builds up in the environment for over a long time. So this is why monitoring CO2 and minimizing CO2 is an important, um, important uh, challenge. 
So there are biomet biochemical properties of CO2, meaning monitoring CO2 can be used to stim stimulating plant growth, respiration rate um, control can be monitored or uh, gen controlled by monitoring CO2 levels for plant growth and so on. Uh, the other industry that is interested in CO2 monitoring is the food industry, food packaging industry, modified atmospheric packaging, where you can detect by detecting the level of CO2 in this packaged food, you can actually detect the freshness of the of your fish and meat and uh, roots and vegetables and so on. So that's a huge market that needs um, CO2 detection. Other, another industry that is interested in uh, CO2 sensor is the obviously exploiting the chemical property, such as testing of concrete carbonation. So the corrosion of concrete, um, you can, uh, you know, basically corrosion rate of concrete can depend on the CO2 level. So you can monitor CO2 level to detect the health of concrete. Um, CO2 corrosion, steel pipe, you know, in oil and gas industries. So you can actually monitor the health of steel pipe that is used in oil and gas industry by detecting the CO2 level in the neighborhood. Um, there is another application of CO2. We know that um, you know, CO2 level in normal breathing air is um, hundreds of ppm. But if the CO2 level, uh, which is comfortable, this level we breathe every day, but if it exceeds to higher concentration, it can lead to all kinds of health hazard and health problem. And this is particularly important for astronauts, for example, they are living in, uh, you know, tiny compartments over a long period of time. So the idea is that if we can attach CO2 sensor on the suits or hats of our astronaut, then we should be able to monitor CO2 level. So this is this is an idea, this is an application that we actually invested some time this application design CO2 sensor. Um, this is, uh, I copied this from an article written by Professor Yamazai that shows actually all kinds of needs for gas sensors, particularly CO2, uh, humidity, uh, hydrogen, and so on. And CO, I should mention, for home application, you know, you know monitoring um, electronic um, health of electronic systems like refrigerator and electric furnaces and home heating furnaces and so on. So many of the Japanese house actually comes with some of this chemical sensing devices already. So in terms of the type of sensors, as I mentioned before, there are IR type, infrared type, that I'm not going to talk about. There are metal semiconductor sensor, metal oxide semiconductor, change of electrical resistance that I'll talk about. Fluorescence type is another one that are very accurate sensors. Uh, and then the electrochemical type that I'll also talk about. So some of this infrared and fluorescence type um, cannot be used in situ, particularly in hostile environment like high temperature or corrosive environment. And some of this metal oxide and electrochemical sensor can be uh, used um, for in situ monitoring. Um, so our focus will be on metal oxide resistive or semiconductive type sensors and electrochemical sensors. And that will be the uh, topic of my lecture next. So here I end first lecture and we'll move on 
for the second lecture, moving on to the resistive type or semiconductive type sensors. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to seeing you in my last, next lecture.